I hope so. You know, just let the Lord, the Spirit, direct your mind, direct our thoughts as we look into His Word, and God lead us in these ways. Um, I'm going to do a little bit different this morning than I would typically do. Have you ever had one of those, what's called an aha moment? You know what I mean by that? You know, just kind of something springs on you and you get it all of a sudden. I, I, I know um, my, my thinking style is kind of pragmatic and that most likely comes from my parents. You know, my dad was a Marine, so he didn't um, beat around the bush with things. You know, he just said, here it is. That's what you did. My mother was a businesswoman and everything, and so she was pretty much the same way. You know, there wasn't a lot of flowery speech and everything. She would say something. That's what she wanted done. That's the way it goes. And and so <laughs> what, what it gets down to is, I don't know about you, but I don't take hints very well. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, in other words, if you, if you want to tell me something, then tell me something. Don't try to candy dance around something, you know, hoping I'm going to get the meat. No, just come up and say, you know, there it is. You know, that's how I operate. Well, you know, God knows that because, after all, God's the one that wired me, right, just like he wired you. You know, and God knows that, you know, with me, you know, subtlety doesn't work. You know, he just kind of has to put it there, you know, where I get the message and, and, and see that. I had one of those aha moments Wednesday night, you know, here at church. Everything. I don't know if you want to use the word epiphany or if you want to use the word of revelation, you know, whatever word you want to use. But this was just something that, okay, God, I got it. Okay, I didn't miss this at all. Well, after um, Wednesday night prayer meeting, um, just as we were getting out, there's a storm that blew in. Okay, and I mean, it was, it rain was sideways, the wind was whipping and all. But what was really odd and all is that you could still see the sun back through the clouds. So the sun was shining, the rain was blowing, you know, and out here the flag was whipping. And just, um, I was helping, you know, Charles get uh, Leslie to the vehicle there. He had his umbrella, I had mine and all. And just as we got her in the vehicle, you know, the rope on the flagpole snapped, and I think, and the flag came down, you know, laying on the ground. So Charles and I went over and got it, you know, picked it up and all that stuff, brought it in, you know, where, where it could be dried and such. And, you know, and, and by the time I'd gotten it in, gotten it draped over a drain and everything where it could drain and start to come back out, there was still a little bit of rain, but the sun was shining. It was one of those weird things, right? You know what I'm talking about? You know, the sun's shining and rain's blowing. You know, it, it was light. And also, I went out and got to my car, went around the building, went down the hill, and just as I turned on the 11, I looked back up, and here was the church. And over the church was a double rainbow. A double rain. I mean, it was like, wow, God, I get it. You know, and what I saw, now this is, this is where it's coming, and this is what's leading into the message this morning, you know, is let's face it, there's an old song called Jesus is Coming Soon, and the first part of it says, troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. You know, freedom we all hold dear now is at stake. You know, we, we, we understand that song. And we've been watching the news. And as a matter of fact, I've got to be honest with you, I was, I was on my computer last night and just going through some news feeds, and, everything, and I finally had to shut it off. I had to step back and say, I can't take this anymore. And I think, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to go out and hurt somebody. I don't know. I was just in that, you know, in, in that state. I couldn't do that anymore, you know. And I've kind of decided on the way to church this morning, I've kind of decided, you know, this week I'm going to do kind of an Internet fast. Everything. I'm just going to shut the news feeds off. You know, I'm not going to worry about it. You know, and just, you know, uh, let, let it go with that. But the point that I'm getting at and everything is, you know, I, the conversation this morning, conversation that we have, you know, we're looking at what's going on in the news and we're saying, what in the world's happening? We look out at Seattle. We look at these other places that are happening. You know, we look at, um, okay, states that are, you know, trying to open back up. Now they'll come and say, oh, we're getting a couple of cases. You know, we may have to, you know, and so there's this, all this uncertainty that's taken on and all of that. And where people are turning, people are turning and saying, what's the government going to do? What's Richmond going to do? What's Charleston going to do? What's Washington, D.C. going to do? Government, you have the answers there. We want to hear the answers. What are you going to do? And here's, here's the message that I got. 
That storm was blowing, just like storms that are blowing through our country today. That flag snapped and hit the ground. But then there's this rainbow. And basically, God was saying, I'm still in control. I'm still in control. You're looking at the wrong place. You're looking for answers from government. You're looking for answers from man. You're, you're, you're getting anxious. You're getting upset. You're getting worried about what's going on. But you know what? I'm still in control. I've got this. You know, what a tremendous message. You know, just in that picture. You know, the picture of the Creator painted. So that, of course, we know what a rainbow's all about, don't we? You know, that's God's covenant that He'll never destroy the earth by water. You know, but nonetheless, you know, that, that was God. And what was really neat is when I look back, this church building was smack in the middle of it. Isn't that cool? You know, I know you can say, oh, you know, yeah, well, you know, elements of this and the sun. That. God's got this thing. God's got this thing. You see. And that's what I want to kind of look at this morning in, in these three scriptures. Because I know that it easy, it is easy, easy to get wrapped up in what's going on. You know, when we, when we think, step back and think that there's a call for our police forces to be defunded or to be scrapped, all that in favor of something, you know, there's a reason that's called the thin blue line. Literally, our law enforcement is the only th thing keeping us from law and order and anarchy. We understand that. And I understand, I understand, pick a profession. I don't care. Pick ministry. There's bad apples in, in everything, Okay. But you can't lump everybody into that kind of thing. There are men and women out there on a daily basis that when they leave their homes and everything, they're only hoping to God that they get back. You know, especially if you're in the urban areas, you know, uh, of today. And certainly we need to be praying for. Don't get me wrong. We need to be praying for our law enforcement. We need to be praying for our government, and such like that. And it's real easy to get all wrapped up in what's going on and everything, and and wind up being anxious and worried and concerned and stuff. Uh, and all, but, you know, the thing that we have to get a hold of, you know, God is in control. I know that sounds simplistic, but God is in control. And his word tells us that, and that's what I want to look at this morning. I've just given three scriptures there. I'm going to take the next couple weeks, this week and next week, you know, just to do what I call, you know, let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be troubled. I'll add some scriptures to this for next week, you know, and I hope that you'll go and, you know, place those scriptures, you know, mark them in your Bible. But the first one comes from Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19, verse 25. Job says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. Now, here's what you need to understand about Job. Job is probably the oldest book in the Bible. You say, oh, no, wait a minute. Genesis is the oldest book. No, keep in mind, Genesis was written in retrospect by Moses, okay? Job, it's estimated, could have been anywhere a thousand years before Moses even came on the scene. So Job's the oldest, uh, oldest uh, uh, book in the Bible. But notice what he says. Let's just break this down for a moment. That's what we're going to do with the scriptures if we're able to get through all three of them. But notice he says, for I know, for I know, I have confidence in. Let me ask you this morning, do you have confidence in God? Do you know what you believe? Do you know why you believe? And do you believe that God is indeed in control? Job knew this, and you know what happened to Job, don't you? Job had it pretty well off. But, you know, Satan came along and everything and said, hey, you know, you kind of got a hedge on him and everything. You drop that hedge and let's see what happens. So God did. We know what happened to Job. And matter of fact, he even had friends and all come and say, Job, just curse God and die. Just get this thing over with. You've been reduced to, a, to, to basically a blob of nothing. Just curse God and get it over with. I know that my Redeemer lives. That there's going to be a time he's going to stand on this earth again. Notice that. He called him Redeemer. Think about that for a moment. That's usually what we talk about, you know, with Christ. Christ our Redeemer, right? No, he's the one that buys the back. That's what the word redeem means. It means to repurchase, to purchase back. Jesus Christ paid the price for your sin and mine. We have been bought with a price. Therefore, we are not our own, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6. So here's Job using the very word, I know that my Redeemer lives. In other words, Job knows, I know who I am, whose I am. 
I know who owns me. I know who's over me. I know who's got this thing. You see, Job understood that. And then he said that same Redeemer, and he could be referring to no less than Christ, that he will stand at the latter day upon the earth. Who's going to stand in the latter day upon the earth? Christ. Because the Bible says when he comes back and all his feet's going to set foot on the Mount of Olives, isn't he? he's going to stand on the earth. So Job said, I know this is going to happen, that he is going to rule, that he is going to reign, and that he does rule, and he does reign. Now let's go to the next scripture, very familiar. So Job had confidence in, in Christ. And here Christ himself speaks. He says, let not your heart be troubled. That word troubled literally means to be agitated. Don't let your heart be agitated. And the picture behind that is a pot of boiling water, okay? Can you get a hold of that? Just water that's boiling. You know, if you're going to boil eggs and you're fixing to put that, you know, that, that boiling water. Don't, don't let your heart be, be roiling, okay? Don't let it be boiling in this one. Don't let it be agitated. When you look at all the circumstances that are going on in life today and everything, don't let it, don't let it get to you. Because then he says, you believe in God, don't you? And of course, the Jewish people believe in God, didn't they? Man, they believe in God. They had this temple they worship. Look at this temple. This is a monument to our God. They believed in God. But Jesus said, you need to believe in me. You see? And that word believe, it all means to roll your burden upon. Okay? I'm going to roll my burden upon him. You see? I'm not going to carry it no more. I'm not going to worry about it anymore. I'm not going to press no more. I'm going to put it upon him. You see, you believe in God. Believe also in me. And then he goes on to say, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Now listen here. I go to prepare a place for you. All right? Now, let's make that personal, shall we? Now, I don't know if you're one of those that you don't like marking in your Bible and everything. If you're that way, you do not want to look at my Bible. Okay. You will be sorely disappointed. It is marked up everywhere. But anyhow, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your handy-dandy little pen or pencil or whatever you got, and I want you to cross out the word you. And I want you to put your name there. This is what it says. I go to prepare a place for Daryl. I go to prepare a place for Gina. I go to prepare a place for Nathaniel. I go to prepare a place for Peggy. You see how personal that is? You see, you see how personal he makes that? That is how God sees us. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And let me tell you about this place that I'm preparing for you. In six days, I brought this universe into existence. I've been working on this thing for 2,000 years. Is it any wonder the Bible says, I have not seen or ear heard the things that God has prepared for those who love him? Don't even try to figure out what it's going to be like, because, folks, it's going to be amazing. But he's doing that as a place that he's going to bring us to dwell with him eternally. This is personal, folks, a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, now notice, I will, what, come again? Isn't that what it says? Now, to me, that's a promise, isn't it? If God says, I will come again, then guess what God's going to do? He is going to come again. There is a promise. There is hope in that. There is joy in that. There is peace in that. Is it any wonder, he said, don't let your heart be anxious. Don't let your insides be boiling over. I'm going to come again. That's a promise I believe in you, and you can have hope and joy and peace in that promise and receive you again. Mark out you. Put your name there. And receive Nicole unto myself. And receive Barry unto myself. And receive Marlene unto myself. That where I am, at the right hand of the Father, there you may be also. Are you getting a hold of just how personal that is? Are you getting a hold of how special we are before God? Look at this. We get all riled up 
because of what's going on out. And I'm not saying don't be concerned, please. I'm not saying, okay, we can quit praying for a government. No, we need to pray for a government. We need to pray for our law enforcement. We need to pray for our first responders. Absolutely. You see, folks, listen. Despite all the negative that we're hearing out that, keep in mind that rainbow. God's saying, I got this. I'm still in control. I'm still here. You see, we can rest in that. And then let's look at the last scripture there. This is Paul speaking in Philippians chapter 4. He says, be careful or be anxious. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, that should be by, my mistake, but by everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. So let's look at that. Everything, everything. Is there anything that we can't go to God with? No. Anything. Oh, but you don't understand. Man, this is just some little everything. Oh, surely God couldn't be interested in it. I mean, this, everything, take it before him, you see? Prayer, supplication, and then notice, with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving represents the attitude that we should be going to God with. Thanksgiving represents the attitude. You know, Romans chapter 8, verse 28, tells us that all things work together for the good to them that love God, doesn't it? All things. Now listen, as a teenager... I adopted that as my favorite verse, but I mis misinterpreted it. I looked at it as that as a Christian, everything's going to be good. That's not what that verse says, does it? It says, all things work what? Together for the good. To them. So basically, here's what it gets down to, the good, bad, and the ugly. It all works together to bring the finished product, and that is that we're like Jesus Christ. Even what's going on in our culture today, even what's going on in society today, all these things work together, work together to shape us and to focus us more and more on Christ. You see, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made unto God. And notice here, the peace of God. I like that, the peace of God. The Bible talks about two types of peace. There's peace with God. And that is when you come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Because prior to that and everything, the Bible says we're at enmity with him. Okay, we're an enemy of God. But when we come to faith in Jesus Christ and all, we now have peace with God. Okay, we are now in a peaceful relationship of being born again. He is our father. We are his children. All right, so we have that peaceful relationship. But then there's the peace of God. So here, here's a good way to describe the peace of God. Let me ask you something today. Okay. Is God panicking about anything? He's not panicking about a thing, is he? That's the peace of God. He's basically saying, don't you panic either. Okay? Don't you panic either. But we get how does the peace of God come, and the peace of God which passes all understanding, it says don't be anxious for things, but be in prayer. Be in contact with God. Have a, th have a thankful attitude in all things. So you don't understand everything. How can I be thankful? Everything, we've got th this person sick, and i got this bill to pay, and my car won't run. And How can I be thankful? You're alive, aren't you? You have people that love you, don't you? Most of us have means, you know. I'll be honest with you. I looked at our refrigerator this morning, which I normally do on the morning when I first get up. But anyway, look at the refrigerator on, you know, morning I thought dang we got a lot of food in there we're thankful we're blessed you see with a thankful attitude in God knowing that God's got everything that God is in control the peace of God which does pass all understanding it surpasses human reasoning it surpasses logic it doesn't make sense in a lot of ways how can you have cancer and be at peace? How can you just have just lost your husband or wife and be at peace? How can you come home and see your house burning and be in peace? It doesn't make sense, does it? it doesn't make sense. That's the peace of God. Knowing that God's got this. 
of the God is over all. Notice it shall keep your hearts and minds through constantly going to church. One person's reading their Bible. Shall keep your minds through what? Christ Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Seek first the good of the community, and all these things will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of God. Where are our eyes supposed to be? And all those verses that I just gave you point to that. I know that my Redeemer lives. Where was Joe's eyes? Was it on his circumstances? Was it on what he had lost? No, it was on his Redeemer. Look what Jesus said. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let the circumstances overburden you. Don't be, don't be anxious or agitated for anything. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Where do we look? Yeah. And then what did Paul say? In prayer, supplication. Thanks, yeah, that's focusing on him. It's not focusing on me. It's looking at God. Next week, I'll have some other scriptures for us to just look at and, and go through. I hope that, you know, this morning, that you'll take these, you'll underline them in your Bible if they're not already. But you'll underline them, you'll go over. And then this week, when you pick up the newspaper, when you turn on the TV, when you flip the computer on, if you got a smartphone, when you start reading through the scrolling through the headlines, you know, where's your focus going to be? I'm not saying not be concerned. I'm just asking you this morning, where are you going to look? And what do you believe? Would you bow your heads, please? Heads bowed, eyes closed.